Hi everyone, good afternoon and good morning to some of you. This is Ravi Sakolinkam, Director of Clinical Research from Oricon Medical. And with me today, presenting alongside me is Justin Pfeiffer, the Vice President of Sales for Oricon Medical. Now the title of today's seminar is Audiological Considerations of the Ponto Bone Anchored Hearing System Before and After Surgery. So this is the outline of the presentation. I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to bone anchored hearing systems. And we will touch on pre-surgical considerations and surgical techniques and skin responses following surgical implantation. And we will also talk about post-surgical considerations in this presentation. So let me start by by asking what is a bone anchored hearing device, I think a lot of you out there would be very familiar what, with what a bone anchored hearing device is. And it is a well established hearing solution for conductive and mixed hearing losses and single sided sensory neural deafness. Now it's based on two principles osseo integration and direct bone conduction. Now osseo integration is when the titanium implant bonds with the bony tissue. That's what also integration is. A direct bone conduction is when the sound processor or the bone anchored hearing aid, if you will, will be able to send vibrations directly to the bony cochlea. So that's a direct bone conduction. And I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more later. Now, the bone anchored hearing device is composed of three parts, three main parts, I should say. A titanium implant, an external abutment, and a sound processor. The sound processor is also called, well, in olden days, we used to call them bone anchored hearing aid, which is uh, a terminology which is still being used in some parts of the world. Now, this is a picture of a bone anchored hearing system. And um, here you have, um, I should go back. Just one slide here. Um, this is a sound processor, and the sound processor actually behaves like a hearing aid in a conventional air conduction hearing aid. It picks up the sounds from the environment, but unlike an air conduction hearing aid where the sound is transmitted as acoustic energy, this sound is converted into vibration, mechanical vibrations, and these vibrations are transmitted to the bone through the abutment and to the implant which is embedded in the bone or in the temporal bone I should say and the sounds are then transmitted to the cochlea directly like that. So the sound processor attaches itself to an, an abutment via the coupling here and the abutment is then fixed to the implant by a screw. So the abutment is like a bridge between the sound processor and the titanium implant which sits in the bone. And this is just another illustration of that. And this actually shows how the abutment sits on the head after surgery. And the bone processor, when it's actually attached to the abutment, and this is how it looks like. This is a picture of the implant itself, where the implant is actually embedded in the bone. And sorry, this is the abutment, I should say, and this is the implant right at the bottom, which is embedded in the bone. And this is just another picture of the implant which is often three or four millimeters long. And the abutment can come in various lengths too. It could be six millimeter long, nine millimeter long, or even 12 millimeter long. And the sound vibrations are transmitted to the cochlea, bypassing the outer and middle ear. And that's the key to direct bone conduction. And this is a picture of how the sound processor picks up the sounds and it transmits the vibrations through the abutment, through the implant, into the bone, into the skull, and to the cochlea. And that's what direct bone conduction is. And there are several advantages with direct bone conduction. First of all, it works independently of ear canal and middle ear. We saw that in the picture before. And because it's direct transmission, the sound is often clearer than the sound you get from a traditional hearing aid. 
and preoperative testing is possible and the varying comfort is is fairly very high uh, compared to a bone conduction uh, you know traditional bone conduction hearing aid and the surgery is straightforward and it's very safe and Justin Fife and my colleague will talk more about surgery uh, um, a little later but let me just go through some of the candidacy criteria for this solution I've mentioned this before, it is a solution for conductive and mixed hearing losses and single-sided deafness. They're the two main groups that this device would be suitable for. Now, as far as mixed and conductive hearing loss goes, um, this device is approved for people five years or older, and the average bone conduction thresholds should be 45 dB or lower, and the speech discrimination scores should be 60% or greater. And symmetric bone conduction thresholds should be there, as that's defined as less than 10 dB difference in average or less than 15 dB at individual frequencies, 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 4 kilohertz, if the patient has bilateral conductive or bilateral mixed hearing loss. So that's the bone anchored hearing system candidacy for mixed and conductive hearing loss, or I should say candidacy criteria. And the typical audiograms you would see uh, would look like this. You have conductive hearing losses here, and there's mixed hearing loss, and this is the kind of automatic profile this solution is very well suited for. And in this slide, we can see when we have the bone anchored hearing aid or the sound processor in place, it actually transmits the sound not just to one cochlea but also to both cochlea. When we do that, we actually bypass the external ear and the middle ear. So if someone has an airborne gap or a conductive element in their hearing loss, you will find that this device will actually help to overcome that airborne gap. So you are getting the sound right to the cochlea, so you are really getting to the inner ear thresholds and you're bypassing that airborne gap. Now what that means is when you bypass the middle ear and the external ear, you don't really need a lot of gain when providing amplification that way because in traditional hearing aids you really have to take into account airborne gap you have to overcome that airborne gap. With this device, you don't need that. So you need much less gain with a bone anchored hearing aid or a bone anchored sound processor. So little amplification is needed and you would get better sound quality because the sound transmission is direct and the ear canal can remain open too. I know that there are hearing aids today that will also keep the ear canals open, the open fits as we talked. But this one is, um, there is no occlusion whatsoever um, because, you know, the sound is directly transmitted to the bone. Now, what are the advantages compared to a conventional bone conduction device uh, like you see in this picture over here? <clears throat> okay, this is a, a, a picture of a conventional bone conduction device. It's not a bone anchor device like this. This is the bone anchored. There's no pressure against the skin and the skull. And there's better sound quality. There's no damping by the skin. So with this system here, you're still going to get some damping because sound is being transmitted through the skin. It's a lot more discreet. It's going to be a lot more comfortable. And, you know, with this device today, you get uh, the same um, advanced technology that you will find in, in a top top of the um, line hearing aid, a very advanced hearing aid. And compared to a middle ear implant, uh, this device uh, also has some advantages. Preoperative testing is possible and, you know, that's not really possible with a middle ear implant. Uh, so we can predict how well this patient is going to do preoperatively. And, and the surgery is very simple and, and, and straightforward. It can be performed under general, and I'm uh, sorry, local anesthesia. The other group of people who benefit from this solution are people with single-sided deafness. The definition of that is um, uh, 
profound unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. By that I mean you would have normal hearing in one year, 20 dB or better hearing thresholds in one year, and then you would have profound sensory, sensory neural hearing loss in the impaired year. <clears throat> and the automatic profile would often look like this. And these are people who would have suffered sudden deafness um, and people who have acoustic neuroma, you know, they may have had their even tumors removed, they will still have the hearing loss, the single-sided hearing loss. So these are patients who will be very good candidates for a bone anchored hearing device. Apart from those two uh, conditions, uh, neurological degenerative diseases, um, uh, genetics, ototoxic treatments, inner malformation, and trauma are the other reasons for single-sided deafness. The clinical aspects of single-sided deafness, um, oftentimes they'll have difficulties um, communicating in group situations, in noisy situations, they'll have difficulties localizing sounds. Uh, you can very well appreciate that because they have input coming from one cochlea, uh, they may have difficulty understanding a person uh, situated on the deaf side. And, and in children, this can present itself as a major handicap in school. They may not have a lot of difficulty communicating one-on-one, -on -one, uh, listening to the TV or the radio, uh, but they'll have difficulties communicating in group situations. And these are the indications for single-sided deafness. Um, uh, I should stress the FTA indications. Um, greater than, greater or equal to five years of age. Sorry about that f little formatting um, error there. It, it is equal to or greater than five years of age and is intended to improve speech recognition and is intended for patients with unilateral sensory or hearing loss when the other ears are normal. And that's one of the indications that I mentioned before. Um, and that means normal hearing in, in that year is defined as um, equal to or better than 20 dB at 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 3 kilohertz. And patients who cannot or will not use uh, air conduction cross hearing aid. And you will see in a second how this device would function as a transcranial um, cross hearing aid, if you like. Um, so this transcranial routing of the signal from the implanted site to the site with with a good hearing, and this is what it looks like. Um, because both cochlea are stimulated at the same time, uh, when you plant this device on the site where there is profound sensory neural hearing loss, the transmissions will actually go to the other side by the bone and the better side will pick up the sound through the transcranial routing of the signal. So the sounds are picked up and converted to vibrations and the vibrations are transmitted to both sides. You can see this deaf cochlea here, but that doesn't um, you know, prevent the, the other side from hearing because the simulation is bilateral. So it works as a cross hearing aid in that sense. Now, speaking of rationale that we use in providing gain for conductive and mixed hearing loss, you can see that the device basically just provides direct bone conduction. It bypasses the middle ear completely. So the, the prescription of gain is going to be based on you know, how much amplification we need to actually provide to the cochlea and that's not going to be a huge amount of gain. And also the kind of amplification scheme you're going to use are going to be based on a linear amplification scheme. You don't need to use compression at all because there is no sense in your hearing loss here. Of course, if there is a mixed hearing loss and there might be a small sensory neural component um, to the hearing loss, and in which case we will use NEL or N. L1, NEL, NL1 prescription formula for that to account for the sensory neural component. Again, there's going to be hardly any compression used in the amplification scheme. Um, for single sided deafness, uh, we have to take into account the bone conduction thresholds of the better side 
Of course, um, the FDA indications state that the better side has to have normal curing. Uh, so we need to take into account the bone conduction thresholds of that good hearing ear. Um, clinics are increasingly actually fitting this device on patients who do have some mild to moderate hearing loss and they're finding it still very beneficial and there's been a publication out there a couple of years ago by Silverson Institute in cases like that and this device still provides um, enough gain uh, to compensate for the mild hearing loss on the better hearing side. So for a single set of deafness, um, you know, there's another thing that we have to um, take into consideration is the fact that you, know, you have deaf ear on one side and you have a good ear on the other side. Now we have to take into account um, the head shadow effect. So um, we know that when the sounds are transmitted to the other side, um, we're going to lose some high frequencies. So then we have to compensate for those high frequencies that are lost. So we do provide more high frequency amplification uh, in single set of deafness. Um, but the low frequencies with the, uh, with the longer wavelength, you know, they can reach the other year. So we don't really have to provide much low frequency amplification. In, in, in some cases, in fact, we may have to bring down the gain uh, for low frequencies. And when we do that, these patients do very well. So that's the, um, the rationale, the gain rationale we use for mixed conductive and single-sided deafness. Um, the preoperative evaluation, now we have a patient who is going to be evaluated for this uh, device and, and if the patient is, um, uh, if patient wants this device and is willing to go for the surgery and then there's a couple of things, a couple of considerations that we'll have to uh, take into account. We have to do evaluation before surgery and then we'll have to look at the patient, um, follow up the patient uh, quite intensely um, soon after implantation and then there'll be regular follow-ups depending on, on the clinic um, protocol. Anyway, there are always questions these patients have before surgery. What will be implanted in my head? Um, you know, does it hurt? How long will it take until I get my sound processor or the hearing aid? And can you see the, the sound processor or the hearing aid behind the ear? Is it conspicuous? These are all the questions, you know, they, they typically have. You know, and the picture is implanted in the, in the skull bone and it's only like three to four millimeters. Um, and, and the button which attaches to the implant can hardly be seen behind the ear. And it doesn't hurt. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes, even less, uh, you know, for some cases. And, you know, is, is, can be easily performed under local anesthesia and the patient can go home after the surgery. And as far as uh, fitting the sound process, uh, we also call it loading, um, you know, three months approximately from the time of implantation that will give time for the skin to heal uh, and for the implant to integrate with the skull bone. Uh, but often these patients, if the skin responses are good and the patients feel comfortable, this patient can be fitted much earlier. These patients can be fitted earlier. In some clinics, they're fitting them as, as early as um, uh, even eight weeks or six weeks. Now, can you see the sound processor behind the ear? It depends on your hair. If the hair is very short, it will show a little. With longer hair, it does not show much at all. And the preoperative evaluation protocol varies from clinic to clinic, but typically they would include the following. Of course, you've got to do the basic audio workup, air bone conduction threshold, speech testing, impedance audiometry, tympanometry, stapedial reflexes, and OE, just to get a good, um, you know, um, audiological profile um, of the patient and then you can see if the patient is a good candidate for a bone anchored solution. And we often do sound field testing with this device uh, with, uh, with a device on a headband or a softband and we look at functional gain. That means we will look at aided versus unaided conditions with the device. The sound field testing could be done using um, any speech and noise test, and often the adaptive tests are used. It could be the hint, the hearing and noise test, or it could be the quick scene, 
or could be AZ Bio, a test that is commonly used with cochlear implantations. They are also increasingly being used for bone anchored solutions. And then the audiologists would present choices. You know, there might be other alternatives to bone anchored devices. They will work through those choices. They talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of these different choices they have. Um, they'll talk about payment, reimbursement issues, um, and they would then trial the patient. You know, typically the patient should try you know, the bone anchor device and another device to see, you know, which one sounds better, which ones you'll be more comfortable with and so forth. So patient-centered counseling is very critical. And, um, and once the patient makes a decision that this is the way they want to go, then the audiologist would then have to find a device that would suit the automatic profile and suit the needs of the patient. So in terms of automatic profile, we have to know what the fitting range is of the different devices that we have out there. Now we have, for, for instance, the Ponto family of instruments, we have the Ponto, Ponto Pro, and Ponto Pro Power. Now for the Ponto and the Ponto Pro, the BC thresholds would have to be 40 dB or lower. But for the Ponto Pro Power, you have another additional dB leeway. So you can actually fit hearing losses up to 55 dB as opposed to 45 dB with the other devices. And this is the automatic profile, you know, for the different devices. Um, and also, patients, if, they are, if the audiologist is considering a point of probe power, you know, these are patients who would have mixed hearing losses. They may have long history of ear diseases. They're often older. They will have presbycusis along with chronic otitis media, which means, you know, they may have some sensorineural hearing loss. So you need something more powerful to compensate for that sensorineural hearing loss. And for single-sided patients too, even if, you know, patients with single-sided deafness and presbycusis on the better hearing side, you know, you might want something more powerful to be able to compensate for the sense neural component uh, or the declining hearing, I should say, in the better year. Um, and when patients actually try these devices in a headband or a softband, you know, audiologists often have to take care of the fact that the sound is being transmitted through the skin. It is not like after surgery when they have the abutment where the device actually conducts the sound directly to the bone, to the abutment, this is done through the skin as a damping effect. And they may have to actually increase the gain by 10 dB at 1K and above, you know, just to compensate for the loss of energy through the skin, transcutaneous attenuation as we call it. Okay, you know, the, this is just a, a slide that shows the different surgical techniques and I'm gonna leave it to Justin to go through that in, in more detail and, and he will, you know, present a lot more slides than I just wanted to just tell you that this is a stage where the patients are going for surgery and now they've gone through surgery, they're, they're now being followed up in the clinic. Oftentimes they'll come back a week after surgery to see the surgeon and also to see the audiologist. And it's very important when the patients come back, it could be like a week, two weeks, three weeks, six weeks. You know, they might be seeing the, the audiologist more often than the surgeon, actually. The surgeons might see them one week, and if, this, you know, if everything looks good and the skin seems to be healing, you know, it will be the audiologist who might be seeing them more often. Um, you know, it's very important that the audiologists understand what is, how the skin heals and, you know, if the patient is really taking care of the skin, you know, they have to keep, it, keep this site clean and they keep brushing and, you know, they have to do all that. But also they have to be able, to, uh, the audiologists have to be able to counsel them on the device. You know, bef you know, when it's time for the fitting, they have to know how to use the device. And there are, you know, there are, there's a session that's devoted to using the device. And know how to use the device. And there are, you know, there are, there's a session that's devoted to using the device. And, you know, they have to go through things like the warranties replacement and, and also they would often do a sound field testing, the functional gain now that the patient is fitted. Now, how can we prove that this aid is actually making the difference that it's, it's designed to make? You know, when we all do that, the patient will be very happy and they will leave with a smile. And just to go through some of the steps in that um, evaluation, post-operative evaluation and the fitting uh, process, 
you know this is how the button looks like when it's um, sits there nice on the on the um, um, on the skull and um, Oh, actually, I should just go back to show you. That's how the uh, the processor looks like when it's attached to that apartment, when it's been fitted. Now, there are a couple of other technical considerations that you have to take into account. For example, now we have the ability to actually measure bone conduction thresholds in situ. Now, the patient has an apartment. Now, we can actually measure bone conduction thresholds right off that apartment with the device. So, the, the device will actually send a signal and, and then it will then um, give the audiologist the, um, the ability to actually measure bone conduction thresholds that way instead of actually using a traditional bone conduction vibrator, the B71 vibrator, you know, the ones that we use to measure bone conduction thresholds in the audiometric booth. Now, that one still has this transcutaneous attenuation issue because the sound is being transmitted through the skin. Now, you are not having that issue at all. You can measure the bone conduction threshold straight off the apartment, which is really, really good. And here you can see doing the bone conduction threshold measurements using both methods, the traditional bone conduction vibrator method, which is actually, um, you know, here in gray. And then you can use the Bisu in situ method here. And... Um, that's the one in red, and oftentimes you can end up with a difference. Um, and the difference can actually be, like in this case, a man of 25 years of age with a trisia, the difference was making quite a substantial difference. Because you can see there is the, the traditional bone conduction threshold curve here in gray and the in situ curve here in red. It's much worse in the high frequencies than the traditional curve. Because you know you tend to um, lose some of that frequencies there, as you know when you are presenting the sound through the skin. So when you do the in situ method, you are providing more high frequency amplification, as this graph shows here, as opposed to using the conventional uh, bone conduction vibrator method. So it does make a difference in some patients. It may not make a difference in other patients, but it does in some patients. So. The golden rule is to actually use the BC in situ for all the patients you have who has an abutment. And if you have a bone conduction vibrator, just use that BC in situ uh, method for measuring bone conduction thresholds. And that way you may get uh, more accurate uh, gain targets. Um, directionality is another uh, important consideration because these patients are going to be using this device in, in noisy situations, different situations, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that there may be situations that they may need directionality and the hearing it may not provide that. Now with the Ponto, here we have this split directional mode which will provide extra opportunities for them to use the device in directional mode and get the benefit of directionality because directionality is the only way to actually improve signal to noise ratio. So if you don't have to split, the patients are going to be in this omnidirectional mode and they're not going to get very good speech intelligibility. And, and, and full directionality is really required only in about eight patients or the patient. This is a piece of information we got from one user through data logging and it's very typical of many users. So by using a, a device that has split directionality, we might be able to give more opportunities for directionality. Now, feedback is another thing that we have to be very cognizant of, um, and, and feedback limit. You know, we all have our own individual feedback limits, and when that limit is crossed, the, the device will feedback, and it's, it's a huge concern, especially when a patient is using a power device. Um, so we have to be able to measure the static feedback limit, and that is that is because of, of the, the vibrations that come off the skull and enters the microphone and sets up a loop gain that way. So the static feedback limit can be measured here with the Ponto system using a software. Software alone, it's very easily done by the audiologists and you know you can, you can measure the individualized one. If you don't want to measure them, there is a default average value built into the software. You can use the default values too. Now what that does is it will actually set the gain, the maximum gain across the frequencies. So any gain that you're going to use is going to fall below that feedback limit. So once you measure the feedback limit, the gain is going to be below that limit. And that will minimize or um, even take away, in some cases, any feedback um, that you're going to experience with the device. So the feedback manager is what um, we call that enables audiologists to measure individual feedback limits and then to set um, the gain. 
below that feedback limit so the device doesn't feedback and they can also turn up the volume control all the way up and, um, and they'll not experience feedback at all. And um, a couple of other considerations when you are trialing the device on a soft band or a head band or even with very young children who, who you know, under the age of five, you're not, um, you know, good candidates for surgery, that have the indication, uh, they have to be older than five or five or older, then, you know, this is a good, um, you know, way of actually giving them the amplification they need, a bone um, conduction um, amplification. But you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're still giving the sound through the, um, the skin. So you're going to lose some energy and you're going to account for that. And there is a, a, a box that you have to check when you're using a soft band or a headband and the, and the software will, will actually correct the gain accordingly. Um, so this is uh, some of the reactions that we get with patients, you know, um, after they've been fitted, they've been using it for a while, they come back and give you some feedback. They will say, oh, you know, I think the Pondo is softer, weaker, but almost always they'll say they understand speech better. So that's the key thing. They have to be able to understand speech. It may, it may sound softer, but softer doesn't necessarily equate to better speech understanding. So the, the key here is to achieve better speech understanding, not whether the, the device is loud or soft. Um, of course, it has to be loud enough to be able to, to provide enough audibility. Um, and, you know, and the patients have to be able to use the device in a variety of listening situations, difficult, complex situations, but that's what we really want them f um, to use this device, um, you know, in those situations. And so, uh, and oftentimes they don't really, if they fit it correctly the first time, you know, um, with the fitting rationals that we have, they often don't require any fine tuning. And, and for single-sided patients, they often say this sounds clearer. Um, you know, sometimes they wonder when you're fitting them in the clinic whether the instrument is doing anything at all because it doesn't seem loud enough for them. Again, you know, you should be careful when they say that not to increase the low frequencies because that can actually, you know, make it worse for them because of upward spread of masking. We want to keep the low frequencies as down as possible for this group of patients. You know, just increase the high frequencies, which um, which compensates for the. Um, um, transcranial attenuation of sound. Now that's that's all I have to um, talk about. I'm just going to hand the mic over to Justin Pfeiffer who's going through some implant and surgery related considerations. Okay, over to you Justin. Thank you Ravi. Uh, that was very good. I just want to, <clears throat> from this point we're going to talk about, like Ravi said, the uh, kind of surgery related considerations, go over um, the wide implant advancements that uh, Otakon Medical has uh, come up with recently. Um, introduction into the surgery, uh, just in case some of you haven't seen uh, what surgery looks like or is. Um, the current sec surgical technique, uh, the new surgical techniques that are out there and currently being performed um, in various sites uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, and then a retrospective uh, implant study on the old uh, Otakon Medical uh, Ponto implant. So what we've done is we've actually uh, used a new type of uh, cutting technology called the OptiGrip technology. Um, it's an implant design um, improved for improved stability. And what it does is it actually um, it starts out with a very um, a very uh, small portion of the uh, of the fixture, and then it kind of widens as it goes out, kind of a conical shape, and then it actually comes back in a little bit. So what it does is with the surface it cuts all the way from the bottom to the top creating new uh, grooves as it goes through so it actually cuts further into the bone uh, which actually helps it with its initial stability. Um, it's based on proven methods and, and the surface that we've been using for years and has actually been used in dental technology for over 30 to 40 years um, and that is the Branamark surface. Um, it's a machine surface um, and it basically what happens is there's a range of surfacing that you can be in to be to be um, for it able to be to osseo integrate well and if you're inside that range it doesn't matter how grooved you are or what your surface machine is but then if you're outside of that range either you're too too smooth or you're too grooved um, that is very bad because the too grooved will actually uh, cause more bacteria and then the too s smooth sur the, s the surface that's too smooth will actually not be able to adhere and osseo integrate to the bone. Um, also with this technology we've minimized bone intervention. Um, so using a smaller countersink um, so instead of a f going to a 4.0 uh, millimeter countersink 
um, we've actually gone into a 3.75 millimeter countersink which is only 0.25 uh, millimeters above what our old one was so we'll actually have a smaller guy countersink hole um, creating more bone cutting uh, for the implant which actually like I said helps with the bone stability um, initially after surgery um, and also one of the good things is we've kept the universal hexacon interface uh, which is actually something that is good because we'll be backwards compatible with ourselves so if a patient had an implant three years ago or two years ago or a year ago um, and then you switched to the, the um, new wider implant the surgeon has then we can still use the same abutments uh, going backwards and forwards on either implant um, we've also um, widen the abutment range so we've actually in, in, had a uh, 12 millimeter abutment that is now um, available um, and things and basically that's going to be good because it's going to meet more patient uh, needs and uh, it's also going to respond to new surgical techniques which we'll discuss later in the uh, presentation as well um, and I think all in all this is going to be simplicity for s clinics and for patients both from a surgical aspect of not having much change throughout the surgery but giving you a better implant and then also for the patients because of the wide abutment range not having to go into uh, not having to go into surgery um, to uh, if you're having some type of complications with skin uh, as well as they go forward um, one of the good things is that of the implant actually one of the very good things is the is the fact that it is actually fully threaded um, in the past technology and even current technology with competitors um, they're using we actually even initially used micro thread technology um, we still have one micro thread that's actually located if I can get this um, that's actually located right here underneath the flange but uh, to make it fully threaded was a was a very big consideration because the more threads the more larger threads you have the better stability you're gonna get and then also the better initial osseointegration you're gonna get um, and we're actually 10 percent or 72 percent versus our old Ponto implant so a 70 per 72 percent increase bone to surface area and actually even 10 percent over the current uh, implant that's uh, the current competitive implant that's on the market as well uh, so that's something that we've uh, that we've tried to maximize and done uh, I think well with our engineering um, this is the Oticon Medical Surgical Instrumentation. This just gives you a look of what um, basically comes with or is used in surgery. A lot of these things aren't actually even used in the surgery, but, um, but this is basically what comes with a kit. Um, what we have is we have uh, the same disposable surgical drills. Um, and what we've done uh, with our uh, engineering as well is we increase the length uh, basically it's for better vision within the surgery so as you're doing um, you want to make sure that the implant and the abutment are 90 degrees to the patient's skull and some patient skulls are actually different and shaped um, shaped a little bit differently per per patient per surgery um, so this extended length actually gives a good realization of what 90 degrees will be and it also gives you a little bit better view from a surgeon's standpoint. Um, also, the six millimeter, we have a six millimeter standard abutment, a uh, six millimeter angled abutment, and the angled abutment is used in certain situations where, um, say, the surgical site looks good and everything else looks good, but as the patient turns their head, maybe the uh, kind of a roll or something that's that's uh, created with, when, with their neck may just clip the device a little bit um, and when it does that it causes a little bit of feedback so what this do does is it actually angles away the device 10 degrees from the problem area and that'll actually um, resolve that problem without having to make uh, the patient wearing a longer to wear a longer abutment um, if the surgical site looks very good we have the 9 millimeter extended abutment and we also have the 12 millimeter extended abutment like I said which we'll we'll actually discuss a little bit later with the surgical techniques um, we have our wide diameter implant both three and four millimeter and then we also have a wide healing cap which is 26 millimeters long um, to help keep the surgical dressing down um, throughout the sur or, uh, post post-operatively um, we're gonna go through the surgical procedure there won't be many um, if you're squeamish uh, don't you don't have to look away on these ones these are cartoon versions but there will be something later and I'll try to remind you uh, as we go forward but this is just the drill that we currently use um, over 
here is the Ponto indicator that's actually just used from the surgeon's standpoint to make sure that the device is not going to touch the pinna um, and cause any type of feedback as well. Um, basically what we do, this is uh, this is based off the dermatome technique um, and so what, would, what would they're doing is actually making a manual flap here um, in in the shape of the dermatome um, so that you can kind of get a full version of what the uh, of, of what the skin reduction will be like and everything else um, so as they remove the flat they move the flap up they basically uh, take out the subcutaneous tissue um, on the right hand side here they're going to remove the subcutaneous tissue here and what you're looking at there is what's called periosteum that's just basically like a skull cap um, of an inner layer of the uh, subcutaneous tissue and uh, what they're going to do is basically make a small incision in the periosteum here just enough to make sure that they can use the guidral countersink to put the implant in and then over here on this side what they're doing is actually removing um, some of this they're doing some tissue reduction so that the site would actually kind of lay down nicely um, and, and kind of be beveled a little bit so that it wouldn't look um, as like a not as much like a um, Basically, some place that that the implant or the abutment can or the processor, I'm sorry, can sit in nicely without touching any other subcutaneous tissue. Um, what they're doing now is actually just uh, they're using a guide drill, and as you see here, the guide drill is something that they want to use. Um, what that does is actually test the um, bone depth. Um, they use a three millimeter guide drill to check to make sure that the patient has enough uh, bone depth in that scenario. And then what they do is they take off this. Uh, cap here um, which is plastic and they remove that and that becomes then a four millimeter guide drill once they get to whichever size they're going to use they use a countersink and what a countersink does is it basically widens the hole to make sure that you can fit the implant in um, this is removal of the um, of the implant and you can see the abutment is attached to the implant which is pretty standard for um, across the bone anchored world uh, where you're using an, an uh, imp implant with an abutment that's uh, already attached it makes it a little bit quicker from a surgical standpoint then basically at a very slow speed which is called 40 new which is basically called newton centimeters but at 40 newton centimeters um, you're going to implant the uh, the implant and the abutment into the bone in the site that you've created um, and it goes very slow because they don't want to well they want to make sure that the cutting edges are cutting correctly but they also want to make sure that you're not um, that you don't burn the bone uh, as you're going in um, and then you're also going to start irrigating at this point uh, once the once the implant actually gets a little bit of uh, once it actually gets started into the site um, from here you'll remove the abutment inserter the implants obviously in the bone it should be uh, tight at that point um, they're putting the skin tissue the outer tissue layer over the site making sure that they biopsy punch uh, right over where the center of the abutment is um, and then what they'll do is they'll put the skin layer down over the site with the abutment showing through and then now you've got a healing cap on there and then they'll dress the healing cap or they'll they'll dress the site and the healing cap will basically be there um, just to hold on uh, just just to hold on the actual dressing or if they use a pressure dressing to hold it on um, either way it'll it'll make sure that the uh, that the patient goes home with something right next to the site which will help for uh, wound healing um, from an implant standpoint we've um, we kind of we've we've stuck with the original design that we have because we feel that it actually works very very well it's a soft supporting shoulder which is di designed to uh, delay or uh, reduce the skin thickening so as the skin decides that you've taken out enough subcutaneous tissue which is this layer right here as it decides it wants to regenerate or come back um, this will hopefully this um, soft shoulder here will actually hopefully prevent it from coming up over the top of the abutment and kind of keep it at a height that we need it at for the processor um, what we've done is we made that perfectly matched interface which uses that hexagon interface system that we um, originally had which actually is what originally came with bone anchored back in the day um, from the old bone anchor processor or implants and even through dental technology is a hex lock um, and what we've done is we've kept that so um, which is nice and then 
also what we've done is we've made this flush on the side here so nothing will actually touch uh, or sit out further on the skin because you don't want any skin being supported by something that's not bone underneath. You actually don't want, um, if it's sitting around a, um, so let's say in the, in the older days, this flange would actually come out a little bit further and what would happen is the skin would actually be supported by the flange and it would cause that red ring that you'd actually see in a lot of patients um, right around the abutment site. Um, and we also have a 100% tight conical seal, which is where no, in the past they've actually done studies where bacteria will come up through the implant here and actually leak out um, in between the connection of the abutment and the fixture. Um, but what we've done is made it a, a, a tight conical seal, so a prevention of any bacteria leakage uh, between that connection site would be for the future. Um, what we've done is, we feel is, is having a 12 millimeter abutment, or basically now a family of abutments, to be able to help patients for surgically from not having to go through surgery in the future once they're done post-op. So if they have any small problems um, that they might have, uh, where a, where a doctor might think that they may need to go through surgery or do something different, they can now. Um, choose from one of these abutment sizes and maybe that can actually prevent them from going back into surgery to do any type of skin revision. Um, as I mentioned before we have a fully backwards compatible um, connection interface with the abutment to the fixture which is nice. Um, you know there are there has been situations where you've had a, an abutment that's different than the fixture connection and it would cause a problem for the entire office. Um, so with the Ponto system you're not going to have to worry about that. You're basically going to have the same connection no matter if they have the older implant or the newer implant. All the abutments will actually work with each patient. Um, and then <clears throat> from a surgical technique there's been no alterations. Basically we have done nothing different from other than widen the counter the countersink uh, with our wide implant and that's it so basically if a surgeon was in there uh, in surgery they would never really notice the difference between the two um, so I think this is where I get into some um, pictures if you're squeamish about surgery and that type of thing so um, you might want to look away for a second but oh, this is actually still the the, the um, cartoon versions but they will come right after this so basically from a alternative skin uh, less invasive surgery um, what they're doing now is they're what they'll do is they'll actually biopsy punch next to the incision site um, and then they'll actually pull the put the implant in and then they'll put the abutment o the skin over the abutment and then make the incision site just next to it now this is actually with reduced skin thinning so what you're seeing now nowadays is that we've noticed over the years that you don't need to have a hairless area uh, around the abutment so they can allow for patients to have hair growing or it be in a hair bearing area um, and not cause feedback with the processors I think the processors are made better but you know and, and uh, from a Ponto standpoint we have a feedback management system um, and some of those things will help out um, and I don't think that um, the hair has much of an issue um, according to e basically from most of the surgeons around the world as they're starting to use these more less invasive um, tissue um, or less invasive surgical techniques. Um, placement of the incision is basically kind of up to the surgeon. Um, I have seen many surgeries and I have not seen a difference between placing the abutment uh, or placing the implant um, adjacent to the surgical site or right down the center of the surgical site. Um, I haven't seen any real complications with either of them. Um, but the, and then there is a new type of incision which is kind of a alternate which is where they actually do some skin thinning around that area um, and then they they will actually let the device sit down. They some but with the 9 and 12 millimeter abutments we're actually getting into a scenario where they're using a lot more biopsy punch type techniques um, which will actually which is where they just biopsy punch the site um, in a small spot they don't really do any suturing there's not much of a large hole at all and what they'll do is they'll let the skin settle at its original height now what they're th the surgeons thinking is is that um, when they do this 
and here's kind of a picture of it now when they do this and they would not even have um, this um, this opening on either side they would basically just biopsy punch this center and like I said one, one of the sur surgeons thinking is that when the skin is at its original height it's not going to actually want to uh, regenerate or actually create more scar tissue or anything underneath when they take out all that skin from the old surgery technique um, and this should actually with the right abutment length should actually keep the site very even um, we should have less tissue complications less scar tissue um, and those types of things which actually will cause problems um, in future with in the future with patients um, you can see here they basically put the implant in they've only just retracted the tissue on either side um, just to make sure that they can see the site very well and then on the right hand side here you can see they only use three um, sutures to actually close the site and then you can see down here they're using the healing cap and the um, alvin dressing and then going forward one week post-operative surgery you can actually see that the skin lays down very well the hair this is a hair bearing area so they're definitely going to be uh, the patient's hair will grow back underneath and around the the uh, processor and the abutment um, but this is something that um, more patients are shooting for more surgeons are shooting for because it it shortens this surgery time and it also shortens the healing time for the patients and they don't also look like they have that large um, tissue reduction around the area which is something that has kind of turned off patients in the past so this is something that going forward a lot of surgeons are using to help out patients with the visual aspect of getting a bone anchor device um, because they do feel that it will benefit them um, over many other um, type of uh, many other options out there um, for either SSD or, or single-sided deafness or um, mixed conductive hearing loss or conductive hearing loss. Um, lastly, I just want to connect on a um, the retrospective implant study that we just did um, very soon before we actually launched. Uh, we completed it soon before we launched our wide implant, but basically it was a total of 98 patients done through Arizona Hearing and Balance, Georgia Health Sciences University, and Michigan Ear Institute. Uh, the mean age for patients was 51.5 years, um, and the gender was 61% uh, male and, uh, or 39% male and 61% female. Um, patient dem what we were looking for was patient demographics, um, length of the abutment used and the surgical technique because we wanted to see if it was actually leaning towards more linear versus the old school kind of dermatome or um, even a manual flap at that point um, and then we wanted to see the incidence of skin reactions uh, implant extrusion and revision surgeries that were needed um, you can see here that there was zero percent of implant loss uh, which is great for the uh, initial implant um, and then we had zero percent revision surgeries uh, most 98% of the implants were used were four millimeters um, and then the abutment length which is actually what we feel is changing was 31% versus this standard six millimeter at 69% people are starting to move towards that nine millimeter and above range um, and then you can see that 96% of the surgeries were actually performed under linear um, with minimal tissue reduction versus the flap or the elliptical which is the kind of a manual flap that they use using um, just a scalpel. 100% um, of the surgery is done in one stage and basically we had about 85% uh, of, the, of the patients had no skin reactions um, and then in the 15% all of them were basically treated um, as part of they were managed uh, just through standard care within the clinic there was no obviously surgical revisions or change in abutment sizes or anything like that so um, I think that is it for Ravi and I and um, I do appreciate you guys uh, coming on and uh, listening to this and um, hopefully we answered a lot of questions that you had and um, and if you have any other questions we'd be happy to field them now